ejections in by Ryan. Ryan's in there! And Green's got it! That is a good one, it's in! Oh, brilliant from Dave Morley! As clean a header as you could wish to see from the big defender. Well, he can't watch. Just that opportunity to get in. And Blundell has got them in here. It's Franny Tierney! Wins it for Doncaster Rovers! Football League, here we come, says Dave Penny. Football League, here we come indeed. Donny Rovers sealed their return to the upper echelons of the game on a memorable Sunday afternoon at Stokes Britannia Stadium thanks to Frantini's golden goal against Dagenham and Redbridge. A remarkable end-of-season run won Rovers the chance to feature in the first-ever conference playoff final. They took their opportunity to win back the Football League status that had been lost in a sea of tears and turmoil a few short years earlier. Days like these are for the fans as much as the players and the management team. Their roller coaster ride had just taken a massive new turn. So, with the club back where they belong, now it was time to see what lay ahead on the road to success. The season kicked off on a scorch of a day in the East End, and Rovers were red hot too. Back in the league, back in the business of scoring goals. Greg Blundell had the honour of striking Rovers first in the Football League since April the 13th, 1998. And it wasn't long before new signing Leo Fortune West was following suit. Paul Green was at the hub of the move. The big striker, a regular winner of promotion medals, finished almost nonchalantly. It was a romp for the Rovers. Barry Hearn's club was left needing snookers when Fortune West struck again. Three goals in the opening half, perhaps beyond the wildest dreams of Dave Penny, but they were there for all to see. Orient's best player, not just on this day, but probably over the whole season, was Matt Lockwood, and he instigated the move that led to Orient's only goal. There weren't too many complaints about the penalty. And it was Lockwood who struck it unerringly. The only blemish, though, on a stunning day for Doncaster, back in the big time. Bellevue's first action of the season brought relegated Grimsby as opponents in the Carling Cup, apparently with a change of fortune too, judging by the huge deflection on their first goal, credited to Stuart Campbell. This was a full-blooded cup tie with the odd unsavoury incident and the Mariners were reduced to ten men when Des Hamilton got himself all tangled up with two in hot pursuit, then thrust his hand into the face of Greg Blundell. He really left the referee no option but to offer him first use of the hot water in the dressing room. Sorry about the post here, by the way, but it does help to hold the stand-up. It didn't totally obscure the view of Ian Anderson making it 2-0 to Grimsby from the penalty spot. Cue the Rovers' fight back, given a little bit of a helping hand by a mistake from player manager Paul Groves. Fortune West prodded in the third goal in two games for him. Defenders left sitting on their backsides. Then the big man's astute ball from a Michael Mackendo pass, and Paul Barnes' quick turn was decisive. The referee awarded the penalty. Dutch defender Marcel Kast knew his fate, and just like Hamilton before him, faced the long walk. Grimsby's ranks were reduced to nine. Then Barnes, the top scorer in the previous season's conference campaign, kept his cool. It was to be his last goal for the club. Over 6,000 roared their approval as Rovers capitalised on their numerical advantage and it was fans' favourite Greg Blundell who pounced to steer Rovers into the next round of the competition. The first league visitors of the season to Bellevue were Southend United, Chris Cooper commentator. Referees have been told to clamp down this season, I'm making sure that 
Defenders are 10 yards back. Free kicks floated in, lofted in back post, just over the bar. I think Warrington would have had it covered if it had been on target, but it was a good header nonetheless from Mark Warren. is taken and swung in and headed in as well and Doncaster Rovers take the lead through captain Steve Foster Doncaster Rovers won South End United nil they tried to take a quick free kick the referee wasn't having any of that then he let them take it quickly little cross in and totally unmarked free header and Carl Emerson's defense let him down let him down there Foster the grateful recipient 1-0 Doncaster Beach for Fortune West. He's having a shirt tucked back there. Fortune West can still profit. Oh, so unlucky. And he might have preferred Ash if he'd been given a free kick there because he certainly deserved one. And a great bit of skill by Leo Fortune West. The goals in their win against Cheltenham last week. Not had a sniff today. Green turning it forward for Blundell, and the keeper has come out of his area. And where is that one going to go? Is it going to go in? And how agonising is that for Doncaster Rovers? This is Marples, gives it back to Patterson. Three of them still in the area. And it's towards Fortune West. We come back out, edge of the area for McIndoe. And he wanted the shot, turned it in there now. Must be something on here. Oh, and what a save as it got in. It's in now, and the referee is going to give the goal. And is it going to go down as a goal for Green, or is it going to be an own goal? Well, it was Paul Green's goal, and Rovers still had a 100% record after three games. Next stop, Central Bank, where Greg Blundell almost took advantage of hesitancy on the part of the home keeper. The white boots of Michael McIndoe also threatened to break through at a set piece. But Lincoln, who'd lost all three of their games by the same scoreline, 1 0, claimed their first point, as Fortune West also failed to hit the target. Rovers first drop points in a goalless draw. Bank Holiday Monday featured the visit of another relegated club to Bellevue, Huddersfield Town. One of returning manager Peter Jackson's new signings, Lee Fowler from Coventry City, showed enterprise with a quickly taken free kick. Andy Warrington, though, was not to be fooled. The Rovers keeper was picking the ball out of the net soon afterwards, though. Tony Cars and John Thorrington were prominent in the build-up. Huddersfield's most prolific marksman of recent seasons, Andy Booth, finished in typical style. The home side's best chance of the opening half fell to Paul Green, but he wasn't able to repeat his effort against South End, the ball going over instead of just under the bar. And when Doncaster did draw level, it was after a probing run by Jamie Patterson. Ironically, though, his miscued final ball turned out to be perfect as Fortune West rose for his fifth goal in as many games. The striker's physical presence was also a factor as Rovers went for maximum points, but they couldn't breach the town defence again. Patterson, closest of all, frustrated to hit an upright. The month ended with a trip to Sixfield Stadium, home of Northampton Town, who'd spent heavily during the summer. The Cobblers were recovering from a modest start to the campaign, but they snatched all three points here, courtesy of a single-headed goal from a former Hull City player, Laurie Dudfield. It was Rovers' first reverse in six outings. A highly satisfactory return, though, to league football had witnessed two league wins, two draws and a solitary defeat, Rovers claiming sixth place.
Hull City brought a big following with them for a Yorkshire derby on a Monday evening with a difference, but neither side could find a goal in a game which showed just how far Rovers had come in such a short space of time. Red and white faithful didn't have long to wait before the chance of goal celebrations came again though it was at Darlington's new and highly impressive Reynolds Arena and they had to thank referee Laws for spotting the foul there on Paul Green he awarded the penalty and Jamie Patterson stepped up to do the honours Darlow, who'd won just two of their opening seven fixtures against lowly Orient and Carlisle, responded thanks to ex-Halifax player Matt Clark, who galloped down the left and teed up Neil Wainwright, another who plied his trade at the Shea. Wainwright was to be the day's headline maker. He'd only struck 12 goals in over 100 games before this day, and here he was striking two in as many minutes. Strangely, it was now five games without a win for Dave Penny and co. They'd last met in the Nationwide Conference. Now Rovers entertained Yeovil Town in their debut season as a fully-fledged member of the Football League. And after Greg Blundell and Michael McIndoe had just failed to nudge Rovers ahead, it was to be the West Countryside who would steal the show. The battle was settled in favour of the Greens by one Chris Blow dealt by Gavin Williams. A somewhat worrying set of results was ended when high-flying Oxford, unbeaten in the league, drew over 5,000. Tim Ryan's spectacular angle finish had the home fans jumping for joy. The shirt came off, but the wheels were back on. A goal in each half did the trick. It was the most significant result of the season so far, and 2-0 sounded sweet indeed when Paul Green ended Oxford's previously undented record. Penalties had featured prominently so far, and there was another when Rovers travelled to Crystal Palace for the second instalment of the Carling Cup. Leo Fortune West in discretion. And Andy Johnson's subsequent spot kick left Rovers trailing. Now who says lightning never strikes twice? Doncaster had that feeling of deja vu not long afterwards. The circumstances very different, the culprits had a different identity. Tim Ryan the guilty party this time. But the end result was just the same. Johnson's accuracy commendable, Palace 2, Rovers 0. At least the gallant Rovers did have the consolation of scoring the only goal of the night to come in open play. John Doolan's run and pass opened up those on Palace sentry duty. And Greg Blundell was away to make the long journey home a little more tolerable. Rovers, though, were out of the League Cup. A sunny Saturday and a shorter journey across the Pennines took Rovers and their fans to Gig Lane. And time seemed to stand still as Leo Fortune West lobbed his first goal in seven games. You don't spurn gifts like that one. The Rovers were developing a very unhappy knack of conceding penalties, whatever the merits or otherwise, of Gareth Seddon's going to ground routine. So despite the protests, it was back to all square. With Andy Priest stepping up and converting his fifth goal of the season, three of them having come from the penalty spot. By half time, though, Rovers were back in the ascendancy. Blundell was developing into one of the hot shots of the division. And this blinding effort was every bit as good as his goal at Selhurst Park four days previously. The most emphatic victory since the opening day of the season was assured when a sequence of passes along the edge of the 18-yard area led to Michael McIndoe sweeping in his first goal of the season. If September hadn't started well, it was finishing promisingly.
Now for one of the games of the season, Cambridge away didn't appear daunting on the face of it, but at 3-0 down it was almost mission impossible. Shane Tudor broke free from midfield for the first. Then 38-year-old player manager John Taylor figured in a move, which led to his giant strike partner Dave Kitson pouching the sort of goal that was soon to earn him a move to Reading. With Andy Warrington left totally exposed at a free kick, Kitson simply nodded in his sixth of the season. The game seemed won and lost. But in a gripping encounter, Rovers returned. Francis Tina, the legend of the playoff final, cut in from a wing position to rifle in one riposte. His first goal of the season was followed by another. Mark Albrighton popping up to head in Tim Ryan's hanging cross. Then, sensing something spectacular in the tales of the unexpected variety, Rovers came again for Ryan to rattle in his second varsity goal of the season. Oxford, now Cambridge. He'll be expecting a blue. Rovers might even have won an unlikely victory, especially when Paul Green took a tumble, all wrapped up in Andy Duncan's tackle, when he was actually going nowhere. But Paul Barnes couldn't complete the perfect comeback, and maybe it was poetic justice that the points should be shared. That poor start to September was reflected in the table. A slip to 10th meant Rovers had been overtaken by the likes of Mansfield and Scunthorpe. Hull City were the new leaders. After the game of the season came perhaps the performance of the season. Bristol Rovers were demolished on the first Saturday in October. Francis Tierney again got the party going with a precision header from Chris Brown's deep cross. Brown, the 18-year-old Doncaster-born striker on loan from Sunderland, was quite a handful. And he savoured the golden moment of scoring his first ever league goal by converting skipper Steve Foster's inch-perfect pass. By now the day was turning into a nightmare for those other Rovers and when John Doolan's hopeful punt forward got them into a totally avoidable tizzy, the only thing that was inch perfect this time was the part of Michael McIndoe's rump that sent the ball whizzing back past the Bristol keeper into the net. McIndoe, the conference player of the season the previous year with Yeovil, would hardly claim that as one of his most glorious goals, but the next was right out of a Matt Letizia masterclass. Three touches of genius, rightly rewarded. There were almost cheers from Doncaster fans when Bristol summoned a spark of resilience to register a goal of their own. Persistence really paying off for the burly Lewis Haldane. But Donny and McIndoe in particular had the last laugh. Brown was sent sprawling. And that presented the summer signing with a chance to wrap up his first league hat-trick. So he did, and this was Rovers' first since Colin Cram's trio at Hartlepool in January 1997. A perfect day. Goals came thick and fast too at Macclesfield. Whitaker. Carruthers! Oh, what a goal! What a goal! Quick return by Whitaker. Big time Carruthers. Quick flick of the head. Past the uh, despairing hand of Andy Warrington. Macclesfield, a goal to the good. 16 minutes gone. Well, that's uh, one out of the blue. Maybe there is no added time. In this case, the board won't go up. Headed on by Mackin McIndoe. Here's Blundell as a pot. Oh, no! Oh, dear me. They went to sleep. They left Blundell on his own. And what a simple goal. Well taken. Matlas Field, what are you doing? Whoops, just uh, avoids the uh, incoming tackle from Doolan. Misunderstanding between Mars and Widrington. 
finds Blundell. Trouble for Mike. Ooh. Now Brown. Green, I should say, and he scores! Oh, dear. What a terrible start. And that all came about because of the mix-up in midfield between Mars and Witherington. Chested down by Foster. Looks for McIndo. He's got Hitchin in attendance, but he tries to get round Hitchin. Oh, he's playing well as McIndo gets inside by him and Whitaker. But don't trip him up. Trouble is Brown! Oh, it's a penalty! Absolutely a penalty. Had to be. Chance for Mile to make a name for himself. Up steps McIndo! And that's it! Three goals to one. Oh, dear me. Battlesfield are going to have to dig deep from here. Mile throws the ball out in disgust to Munro. Well, the commentator may have got his greens and his browns mixed up there, but there was no stopping this colourful Rovers side who made Chester blue in the LDV Vance Trophy with a 1-0 win. Mansfield can make life tough for anyone with their excellent wingers and Wayne Corden on the left, pass to the gifted Liam Lawrence on the right. And Liam it was who scored to threaten a second home defeat of the season for Doncaster. Inside the third month of the campaign, this was already a battle of promotion pretenders, and Rovers responded quickly. Michael McIndoe's intuitive through pass the prelude to Greg Blundell's cheeky finish. While Mansfield were again among the top scorers in the league, there is a fragile air to their defending on occasions, and that was evident when Paul Green was given all the time and space he needed, and Rovers led for the first time in the match. They extended that lead as well when Premiership referee Mark Halsey ruled deliberate handball against a slightly bemused Rhys Day. Others in the yellow and blue seemed equally baffled, but it was yet another spot kick. And yet another successful conversion for McIndo, his third in consecutive matches. It was pure carnage by now, and Mansfield's goalkeeper captain Kevin Pilkington was clearly afflicted by the malaise, aiming his clearance straight to Chris Brown, who, having got over the shock, proceeded to waltz through and bang in Rovers' 18th goal in the last five league games. Then, after a long punt from Lawrence and a couple of Doncaster defensive clangers, it was the turn of Andy Warrington to look somewhat underwhelmed as Mansfield's Corden rounded off the scoring in a six-goal thriller. Rovers had netted no fewer than 11 goals in their last three home fixtures, so there was no need to be fearful about a visit from Rochdale especially when a delightfully constructed team goal meant another notch for Francis Tierney. The Lancastrians were coming into the match on the back of a notable triumph at Cheltenham, though, and unfazed by that setback, they found a goal of their own. It was struck by Kevin Townsend as the Rovers' defence was just caught napping for once. The fleet-footed Michael McIndoe was again causing problems and he set up a decent attempt by John Doolan to break his scoring duck for the season. He didn't quite make it. The Rovers did still go on to claim the points with a slice of luck, it has to be said. Chris Brown's shot found the net after a ricochet from a very unhappy Rochdale defender's midriff. First ever league meeting with Kidderminster Harriers at Agbrew was next on the agenda, and their manager, Jan Mulby's midriff, will have sagged at the sight of Doncaster's first goal, tucked away very nicely by Greg Blundell, prospering from the sort of back pass that turns managers grey. A less blatant pass, but of the same variety, also led to Rovers' second goal. This time it helped release Michael McIndoe, 
and Blundell. And when the cross was whipped in, it was Chris Brown who stole a march on the kiddie defence to nick in his third goal in as many games and his fourth in six. So October had come and gone and Rovers had rocketed nine places thanks to five wins on the spin, their best sequence in the league since the opening five games of the 1991 season. Only Hull City stood ahead of them. Everyone knew the next game would be tough. Torquay were one of the most improved teams in the league, lying seventh themselves, but keen to erase the memory of a shock defeat at Boston the previous week. Although Michael McIndoe had gone close there with an audacious piece of individual sorcery, it took a rare moment of craft to open up the visitors. John Doolan's pass perfectly weighted. Paul Green's finish beautifully executed. 1-0. Good enough. 1-0 was not good enough in the next two games, though, because that scoreline spelled defeat each time to Blackpool in the LDV Vans and, surprisingly, to non-league Scarborough in the FA Cup. What was that about being able to concentrate on the league? So to another Yorkshire derby. York City had started the season at a canter. Four wins off the reel, top of the table, but they'd slipped badly, no wins in seven prior to Doncaster's date at Booth and Crescent. One of the season's most debatable penalties settled the issue. Lee Nogan went down under the slightest of contact, if any, with Mark Albrighton. And the man who makes the decision said, yes, penalty. Darren Dunning didn't stop to ask any questions and Rovers completed a hat-trick of unwanted single-goal defeats. It was just like old times when Boston United came to town. Memories of conference rivalries flooded back. With the traffic zooming past the race course, Rovers cleared the first hurdle. Quick thinking from John Doolan and Chris Brown rose to nudge Rovers into the lead. There was a good pattern developing to matches at Bellevue. The night may have been gloomy, but the performance certainly wasn't. And the lights went out on Boston's challenge when J.J. Melligan also struck from close range. The luck certainly wasn't going with Boston. And there was a truly comprehensive ring to the scoreline when Brown registered his second of the night. Rovers three, Boston nil. it looked like there were three points there for the taking it was when Rovers set off for their most northerly destination Carlisle a team with just five points from 19 matches and one paltry win but it's not always as easy as it seems and Rovers were grateful for Leo Fortune West's first goal since the end of September he was equally grateful and it would have been 2-0 but for Carlisle keeper Matt Glennon who performed heroics Especially here as he foiled Michael McIndoe. Rovers, though, still had to settle for 1 0. Going into the 12th month of the year, Rovers were still nicely poised behind new leaders Oxford United, and Dave Penny was talking of 10 more points to be sure of avoiding relegation. No action for a fortnight, but that didn't appear to blunt the Rovers' well-oiled machine. They came back with a bang at Cheltenham. The cameraman wasn't so sharp and missed the incident, but fortunately not. Michael McIndoe's opener from 12 yards out with the penalty kick. The Robins were soon chirping again, though a typical set-piece goal and a fierce header from one-time Rovers man Mark Yates. We haven't heard too much yet of another playoff final scoring hero, Dave Morley, but he came to the fore at Wadden Road, timing his run perfectly. 
And talking of runs time to perfection, here's another one from JJ Melligan, a newish name, but a welcome addition to the scoring list. And 3 1 to the row as it was. Now, this was a crunch game. Promotion rival Swansea City came to Bellevue on the Friday night before Christmas week, and what a cracker, if you'll excuse the pun. Andy Robinson would have taken centre stage, but for the other, handy Andy Warrington there. Rovers needed a break and they got it when the referee ruled that big Alan Tate had been using Michael McIndoe as a stepladder. Despite the protests, we all know what happens. The referee sticks by his decision. McIndoe scores, that's five from the spot for him and a total of eight for the season. It's clear Dave Penny and Mickey Walker like their players to pass the ball around until an opening appears. And here's a classic example. Patience personified until JJ Melligan's cross is coolly clipped into the net by Paul Green. Swansea did have two of the division's deadliest strikers in Robinson and Lee Trundle, and they conjured up an excellent goal of their own. Robinson thumping a shot beyond Warrington from all of 25 yards. It was a memorable night for all concerned as Rovers climbed to the top of the league. Dave Morley was close to scoring for the second game running. And Rovers sealed their triumph emphatically with top hitman Greg Blundell racing onto John Doolan's defence splitting pass to claim his eighth so far. Off came the shirt and out came manager and penalty taker to describe the feeling. Three points um, to put us top of the league is, is a great result. Um, Swansea caused a lot of problems tonight, especially the second half. Um, we managed to hang in there and, and get the third goal in the last minute, really, to kill the game off. So, um, great result, great three points, and uh, it lets us enjoy tomorrow and uh, look at the results when they come in at five o'clock tomorrow. And how does it feel being top of the league? Good for Christmas. Uh, hopefully, the results go away tomorrow. We'll wait and see. But um, it's not bad for a team that's supposed to be tipped to go relegated in the start of the season, so we're doing okay. Nine thousand to watch Scunthorpe, who nearly spoiled the party with Steve Torpy's header, ruled out for offside. The best Rovers could offer was Leo Fortune West header, which came back off the inside of an upright. A punchless boxing day seemed certain, but then late in the day, substitute Adriano Riglioso produced a run and a pass that invited Greg Blundell to take the plaudits. And away he went again on one of those bicep-revealing runs. The old year didn't end quite so well, though. An incredible 23,000 turned up at the KC Stadium to see the clash of the region's top two protagonists. Jason Price was soon roaring for the Tigers. But then the Rovers hit back. Leo Fortune West showing nifty close touches of a Dennis Bergkamp variety to restore parity. But the price was right for Hull on this day. Jason of that name was in position to catch the Rovers' backline square and then netted his second of the match. Then, after Ben Burgess's header had been parried by Andy Warrington, Price was there again to complete what was to prove Hull's only hat-trick of the season. Not a bad day on which to do it, mind you. All that meant Hull closed the gap on Doncaster to two points. Rovers themselves were just two adrift of Oxford United. The top five had pulled nicely clear of the pack. Another big crowd, over 13,000, welcomed in the new year at the McAlpine Stadium. And Huddersfield fans were soon welcoming their first goal of 2004, headed in by a striker destined for the Premiership, John Stead. Stead turned out to be the difference between the two sides that day. His second goal took him to 17 for the season. His next in the following game would be his last before joining Blackburn Rovers. 
a prodigious talent, just like Rovers' Michael Mackindo and Greg Blundell, who combined down the left, the latter halving the deficit with plenty of time still to go. But it was Huddersfield who notched the final goal, this time Stead turning provider with some good close control, the coup de grace supplied by John Worthington. Might have been a hangover after two such crucial defeats over the festive period, but not a bit of it, just as late Norient. Rovers proceeded to record their first double of the season, just a week after the disappointment at Huddersfield. Leo Fortune West turning up just where centre forwards are supposed to turn up. The East Ender, born just up the road from Orient's ground, never scored in his short spell with the club back in the 90s, but he made it four in two games against them with another tap-in as Rovers went to town in the first half. And he had a first hat-trick in Doncaster Colours to celebrate before the break. John Doolan found JJ Melligan, and the cross picked out the big man for a nicely angled header. While Fortune West was moving into double figures for the season, his partner Greg Blundell was pulling the Orient back line all over the place, and it was fitting he should get his just desserts with a goal of his own, squeezed in from the tightest of angles. By now the biggest win of the season was very much on the cards, and it duly arrived, thanks to a shocker of a clearance by the Orient keeper. Blundell unselfishly offered up a first ever league goal to Peter Hines, a striker on loan from Aston Villa. The season's second double came a week later at Roots Hall, and guess who was first contributor again? Leo Fortune West had started the season with a glut of goals. He started the second half of the campaign in similar vein. Quick thinking by Paul Green was the catalyst to the second goal. Greg Blundell sprinted onto the free kick, Michael McIndoe on hand in the nick of time. Two Friday night's home games beckoned, the first yielded one of the most disappointing performances of the season. Lincoln, always difficult to play against, also enjoyed a huge slice of fortune. Francis Green's cross flew into his own net off Tim Ryan. And to this day, you won't convince anyone of a Rovers persuasion that goalkeeper Andy Warrington wasn't fouled, as Lincoln made it 2-0. Gary Fletcher backing into his man before hooking the ball over his shoulder into the net. Seven days on, a different performance and a different result. The decisive moment against Northampton Town, this one, featuring Leo Fortune West's chest and Paul Green's left foot. At least memories of Lincoln had been erased. Yeah, I think so. It was important we got three points after losing last week at home. Um, we let ourselves down badly last week. We, we played a lot better today, um, but we're still not quite on top of our game. But let's say the three points is amazing. Not at the top of their game, nor the table. Hull were back there, but the 50-point barrier had been broken through and a five-point gap opened up ahead of the closest challengers. <laughs> Defensively, Rovers had done remarkably well, conceding an average less than a goal a game. But for once, they were guilty of letting in a soft one at Scunthorpe, Steve Torpy, the beneficiary. when Scunny's Doncaster-born defender Andy Butler prodded in Peter Beagrey's corner, it looked like being a bad day at the office. But there was a growing resilience about Dave Penny's side, and they were thrown a lifeline by Nathan Stanton's penalty box foul on Michael McIndoe. The usual handbags were thrown during the immediate inquest, but the referee was unmoved. And after peace was restored, Mackindo stepped up to spark the comeback. Scunthorpe, beaten at Bellevue on Boxing Day, hadn't enjoyed a league win for over two months and they again failed to hold on to their lead as Leo Fortune West bounced to claim a valuable point. His fifth goal in the last five games. It would transpire, though, to be his last of the season. There 
are some days when the performance may not be pretty, but the result is all that matters. Macclesfield at home was just such a day. When Carl Munro was punished for having two bites at Chris Brown's body, it seemed retribution was at hand. As always, Michael McIndoe was spot on. For just a moment, the referee wasn't happy. Someone had encroached. A retake was demanded. And as so often happened this time, Macclesfield keeper Steve Wilson guessed right. For once, McIndoe was foiled. Rovers just had to keep plugging away. Eventually, they did get their goal. McIndoe's cross and Greg Blundell's acrobatics not to be denied this time. with Mansfield tend to be eventful but this one certainly was with so much resting on the outcome every decision was vital imagine how Rovers felt then when Mansfield were awarded a spot kick Liam Lawrence was the top scorer in the league from penalties but he only just squeezed this one beneath Andy Warrington Rovers had won a reputation as entertainers built on the fact they'd failed to score in only eight of their 36 games so far and Greg Blundell calmly clipped them back to level pegging. This was to be Blundell's day. And after J.J. Melligan breached the Mansfield back line, it was good old Greg again who had those Rovers fans jumping up and down with him in very close proximity. It may only have been 2-1, but this was a big win. The sceptics were by now beginning to believe in the miracle of another promotion and over seven and a half thousand, two thousand up on the opening home league game witnessed the slaughter of Kidderminster. Mark Albrighton set the tone, then Greg Blundell weighed in with another of his classics. The previous season signing from Northwich Victoria now paying off handsomely. The Harriers were made to chase. Paul Green doing everything but score the next goal. After he'd made all the inroads, the scoring honours fell to Ricky Ravenhill, the first in the Football League for him, and certainly a moment to savour. Then Blundell's tenacity, craft and power all came together in one moment as Rovers threatened their third five-goal haul of the campaign. And a nap hand it became when more excellent teamwork was capped by David Mulligan's blinding finish. His first for the club since signing from Barnsley. By the end of February, the name of Doncaster Rovers had soared to the top of Division 3. Now all the talk was whether it would be promotion and the championship or merely the playoffs. Confidence was sky high. One of the season's early title challenges, Swansea City had fallen away but still represented a stern test at the Vetchfield, especially when they scored first through Stuart Roberts. A point away from home on a Friday going into the weekend is always acceptable, and that's what Rovers travelled home with. Tim Ryan's lob ball, Michael McIndoe's chase and pass, and Chris Brown's measured finish saw to that. Indeed, Dave Penny might have had all three points from one of his old clubs, but for arguably the miss of the season. David Mulligan, recently recruited from Barnsley, did it all right. Unfortunately, Leo Fortune West got it all wrong. <music> Cheltenham, well beaten back at Wadden Road in December, proved a tougher nut to crack than expected. Indeed, they had their noses in front at Bellevue, thanks to Martin Devaney's deflected shot. The 7,500 had got used to home wins by now, though, and they were in good voice by the time the visiting keeper made a hash of a cross and almost gifted an equaliser to Michael McIndoe. That point-winning goal did ultimately arrive, and again, persistence was the key to it. With Cheltenham's defence dithering, Chris Brown added to his growing collection of goals.
what was encouraging from Dave Penny's point of view was that goals were coming from all sources. There had been 16 different names on the score sheet and it was midfielder Ricky Ravenhill who came up with the goods to seal another crucial win and revenge for September's home defeat. One of the few players without a goal to his name was John Doolan and he was disappointed again to miss the target just against Darlington. Darlow had caused problems for Rovers earlier in the season. They did again at Bellevue, storming ahead thanks to a vicious swerving shot from Mark Convery. It meant Rovers again had to come from behind, and they did do, with yet another new name getting on the scoreboard. Londoner Bioakin Fenwa, who'd arrived via Lake Norrington, Boston, made his mark as a second-half sub. There's not a lot to be said of the visit to Oxford, it was goalless. It was a good point for Rovers nonetheless, and 8,483 saw nothing better than Michael McIndoe's effort. Enough said. The only other league jaunt into Lancashire had been productive, a win at Gig Lane, but at nearby Scotland it was lowly Rochdale who struck first, a classic back post header by Lee McEverley. And then Dave Morley drilled a free kick into the heart of the Rochdale goal mouth and when the ball dropped his way, Mark Albrighton proved that defenders can be just as deadly as attackers. With the final furlong in sight, Rovers were counting down to the day they might get promoted. The top of the table was suddenly dominated by sides from the north. win over Berry would take Rovers closer to their goal, but they were made to wait until the second half before Greg Blundell eased the tension. It was his first goal in seven games, but crucial to the cause. And after that it was plain sailing. The increasingly popular Biwak in Fenwick bludgeoned his way through to set up Blundell's second soon afterwards, his 18th in all and third double in a match. All the locals wanted now was for their new hero to grab a goal, and he duly obliged. Blundell returning the favour. Cue the Akin Fenwa dance. Although ex Leeds United player Harpal Singh silenced them momentarily with a fine free kick, this was Rover's day. Anticipation was running ever higher. remember Bristol Rovers had taken a fearful spanking back in October now they wanted revenge no chance and no mercy as the visitors to the memorial ground edged ahead with Ricky Ravenhill's third success in nine games once again Rovers were hauled back though to set piece with Bristol's score of the former Sheffield Wednesday striker Junior Agogo Time to batten down the hatches. Bioakin Fenwell was hammering away as lustily as anyone. And heeding the old adage, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. He did do, with perfect reward. And so to the day when promotion could be sealed. If they don't do it today, Doncaster will have another chance at Torquay on Saturday. But I'm sure they'd like to uh, pull off their promotion in front of their own fans, and here might be the opening. It's Blundell, it's Akin Fenway! That's the goal! That's the goal that could take Doncaster Rovers into Division 2. And it's the 1-2 again of Greg Blundell and Bio Akin Fenway. Akin Fenwa scores his fourth goal as a Doncaster Rovers player, his third in consecutive matches here at Bellevue, and he is their hero.
Well, this forward combination, uh, Blundell and Akin Fenwa, is an absolute menace to opponents. And here's the latter now. Mulligan through to Melligan. Mulligan's made a run. And takes again here now. Then he finds Ravenhill. Then it's Mulligan. This is a lovely build up from Doncaster. Goal number two. Headed in spectacularly here by Paul Green. And Doncaster for certain are now on their way up. A moment for the young man Paul Green, rejected by Sheffield Wednesday. He's going to be playing against them next season. Man of the match at Stoke in the playoff final last year when Doncaster came out of the conference. Now he's going even higher. He's going up to Division Two with Doncaster Rovers. Paul Green. This is a fairy tale. Doncaster Rovers were playing non-league football 12 months ago. Next season they will be playing second division football. They'll be rubbing shoulders with Sheffield Wednesday and teams like Wimbledon who were in the Premier League two years ago. It's the most astonishing story. And for Dave Penny, for John Ryan, for everybody connected with this club, the president Trevor Milton, all the players, this is a phenomenal achievement. And welcome to the second division, Doncaster Rovers. Naturally, with the target achieved, there was a temptation to take the foot off the accelerator pedal. So defeat at Torquay, promotion bound themselves, was not too surprising. And Rovers' cause was hardly helped by David Mulligan's red card for what is ludicrously called a professional foul. Referee David Crick with the decision. Keith Hill and David Graham, the latter destined for a summer move to Wigan Athletic, were key members of Leroy Rossini's side, and they were the two who combined to inflict defeat on Rovers at play more. And to confirm this was just not Rovers' day, Leo Fortune West had a goal disallowed. It was party time when York City came to Bellevue for the first home game since promotion had been clinched. And that trusty twosome, Michael McIndoe and Greg Blundell, struck for the umpteenth time. Not much had been seen of Chris Brown of late after that spate of goals earlier in the campaign, but he was back here engineering his first goal since the draw against Cheltenham just six weeks earlier. York, sadly destined for the conference, did find a goal through Darren Dunning's free kick. But Rovers still had the last word, McIndoe turning his opponent inside out and supplying the cross which enabled Brown to register his second double in nine goals for the club. season's final away day took Rovers the short distance to Boston and Steve Foster who kicked off the season with a goal was as close as anyone to finishing with one denied by Paul Bastock the summer break was beckoning Boston were happy just to have had a revival which ensured a third season of league football and Rovers of course were delirious to be going up for the second year running in one of the most successful chapters in the club's history So, to the final curtain for the season and Carlisle's hopes of staying in the Football League. Paul Simpson's side had performed wonders to even give themselves a chance of survival. And they kept scrapping, especially when Matt Glennon kept out Greg Blundell's penalty. Rovers are winners, though, and Steve Foster's glancing header brought a touch of symmetry to the season. Remember, he'd scored in the opening home win of the campaign as well. 
Carlisle were down, but Doncaster were very much up. It really is extraordinary to think that a little over 12 months after leaving non-league football, they'll now be operating in League One of the revamped Football League. From chairman John Ryan through manager Dave Penny, assistant Mickey Walker, players and fans, this is a truly remarkable story of just what can be achieved in football. With a vibrant air coursing through the veins of the club, the sky is now the limit for Doncaster Rovers. And this is how the table looked at the end of a glorious campaign. Rovers promoted four points ahead of fellow Yorkshire rivals Hull City. Torquay United finished in the third promotion place. And Huddersfield Town went up after a goalless draw and a penalty shootout against Mansfield Town at Cardiff. So congratulations to Rovers. This is John Helm saying I hope you've enjoyed the show and see you next season.